Section six of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophion by Alex Soyer. Grains, seeds. One of the most important was mustard seed. Pythagoras maintains, and no one has contradicted his assertion, that this seed occupied the first rank among alimentary substances which exercise a prompt influence on the brain. Indeed, the ancients attributed to it the same qualities that we do at the present day. Mustard, according to their opinion, excites the appetite, gives piquancy to meat, strengthens the stomach, and facilitates digestion. It is better suited, say they, to bilious constitutions than to lymphatic persons, and they recommend its use in summer rather than in winter. The good Pliny, always disposed to adopt, without much examination, any stories provided they were but slightly exaggerated, was convinced and infirms with his accustomed good humor that this plant is a sovereign remedy against the bite of the most venomous serpents. It is only necessary to apply it to the wound, and again, if taken inwardly, there is nothing to fear from the poisonous effects of certain mushrooms. The doctors of the nineteenth century are, apparently, little inclined to adopt the method recommended by the worthy naturalist. Mustard seed is only mentioned in the Bible as a term of comparison. Its alimentary qualities are nowhere indicated. The Romans and other nations after them fermented the seed in new sweet wine. It is from this, perhaps, we must seek for the origin of the word mustard. Mustum ardens, burning wine. Some gastronomic writers give it another derivation, not generally adopted. This condiment, say they, was formerly called sauve or seneve. It was only towards the close of the fourteenth century that this name was changed. Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, marching against the inhabitants of Ghent, who had revolted from him, and the city of Dijon having supplied him for this expedition with a thousand men at arms, the prince, in gratitude, granted to the city, amongst other privileges, that of bearing his arms with his motto, Molt Metard, the whole of this was carved on the principal gate of Dijon, but an accident having destroyed the middle word, the two others, Molt Tard, caused many a smile at the expense of the Dijonais, and as they traded in Seneuve, mustard, this grain was called in derision Moutard, when it came from Dijon, a name it has preserved ever since. If this etymology is not true, at least it is ingenious. Coriander, among the Romans, appears to have possessed the same property as mustard, that is to say, they considered it was strengthening and digestive. They employed it also in a very useful manner during the great heat of summer. They mixed it with vinegar, after it had been well bruised or pounded, and laid it over any kind of meat, which this coating preserved in a perfect state of freshness. Pinney classifies the bitter seed of the lupin as a grain pertaining to that of wheat, and if you soak it, he says, in boiling water, it becomes so mild that it can be eaten. Zeno of Citium was of the same opinion. This philosopher, with all his wisdom, could not help showing his bad temper, even towards his best friends at times, but was very affable after he had quaffed several cups of delicious wine, 
One day he was asked for an explanation of this contrast in his temper. That is very simple, he replied. I am of the same nature as the lupins. Their bitterness is unsupportable before they are soaked, but they are of an exquisite mildness when they have been well steeped. We strongly doubt, nevertheless, whether this plant has ever been honoured by the patronage of connoisseurs and people of delicate taste. A very high authority in cookery, Lysiphon of Chalice, used to say, with a kind of disdain, that this despicable plant was hardly good enough for the common fare of the mob or to feast the guests at a beggar's table. It was principally used as food for cattle, and not without reason. If it be true that twenty pounds of lupins are sufficient to fatten an ox, the lovers of etymology, who may be classified in the family of readers of logogryphs, were in raptures at finding the following. The Latin name of lupinius has been given to this grain because the lupin wears out and destroys the land nearly as the wolf destroys and devours the flocks, whereupon they exclaimed with pride, Lupinius a lupo. At the period when the gods did not exact much, but were contented with humble offerings, men placed on the altars loaves made of linseed meal, a treat the immortal gratefully accepted, though certainly it would not much tempt us of the present day. The Asiatics afterward thought of pounding the linseed, frying it, and mixing it with honey. These cakes seemed to them too good for their divinities, so they ate them themselves. In the time of Pliny, the Lombards and Piedmontes ate this miserable bread of the gods, and even found it the most agreeable flavor these nations have since improved their taste. Shall we mention hemp seed, the cannabis of the ancients, which was served fried for dessert? That hemp should be spun and made into ropes, well and good, but to regale oneself with it after dinner, when the stomach is overloaded with food, and hardly moved from its lethargic quietude by the appearance of the most provoking viands that art can invent, what depravity, what strange perversion of the most simple elements of gastronomy. The Arabs, that wandering nation who are not yet acquainted with the roasting spit, nor the voluptuousness of a delicious repast, formerly intoxicated themselves with a beverage extracted from linseed. We, who are in possession of generous wine, let us deplore such excesses, and not imitate them. End of section 6 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 7 of Pantrophion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophion by Alex Soye. Vegetables. All nations have sown vegetables, and judged them worthy of their particular attention. Sometimes they have even confounded many of these plants with the cereals because they were converted into flour and bread, especially in time of famine. After the deluge, when God made a covenant with Noah, he said, with respect to the food of man, Even as the green herb I have given you all things, and, subsequently, to that epoch, the holy writers frequently demonstrate, in their simple and interesting style, the various uses which the Hebrews made of vegetables. Esau, pressed by hunger, sold his birthright to Jacob for a dish of lentils. 
Among the presents which David received from Shobi were beans, lentils, and parched pulse. The four Hebrew children were fed with vegetables at the court of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It is sufficient, we think, to indicate these passages, without uselessly increasing the number. The heroes of Homer, those men covered with iron and brass, whose terrible blows dealt death and desolation, reposed after the exploits, partaking of a dish of beans or a plate of peas happy simplicity of the homeric ages patroclus peeled onions achilles washed cabbages and the wise ulysses roasted with his own hands a sirloin of beef one day the son of thetis received under his tent a deputation sent by the greeks to entreat him to be friends with agamemnon the young hero, who could only be accused of a little pride and passion, invited these worthy personages to dinner, and with the assistance of his friend gave them a magnificent banquet, in which vegetables occupied a most conspicuous place. Sixteen Greek authors have devoted their vigils to profound researches concerning the qualities of these useful plants. Their works have not been transmitted to us, but their names are to be found inscribed in the gastronomic treasure which Athenus, that grammarian, philosopher and epicurean, has bequeathed to the meditations of posterity. But it is principally with the Romans that this interesting branch of the magiric art flourished. They have told us that this great family of herbs took the name of vegetables legumia because they were chosen and picked by the hand and their most celebrated horticulturists have prided themselves on the preparation of the ground to which they were confided on the attention which they claimed and on the hygiene virtues which experience attributed to them heathen theology too consecrated several of them to the solemn Minities of their religion, and some nations even considered them worthy of their homage and the fumes of incense. Virgil himself seems to regret his inability to sing of gardens and vegetables. Perhaps a rapid sketch of what the great poet says on this subject may not be misplaced here. Si mon vassou l'entempe igar loin du bord ne sa hâte un fan le regarde le port pour être je prendre le sien chéri de flor les narcisses et mes vers se empressent de le cor les roses mouvrent leur calice brillant le tortue concombre en drande ses flancs du percé toujours verte des pales chicorées Ma muse a bevalier la tige alteré. Je coupere le lyre et la assente en berceau. Et du mirth à mes os, je embré les os. One more fact will serve to show to what extent the Romans carried their enthusiastic affection for leguminous plants. We know that illustrious families did not disdain to borrow their names from them the appellations fabris cicero and lentulus thus enhanced the humble renown of beans faba peas ciceritium and lentils lenticilla the eminent orator we have just named gave the preference one day to a dish of beetroot instead of oysters and lampreys of which he was passionately fond it is true that since the promulgation of the licinian law which allowed but little meat and plenty of vegetables the voluptuaries of rome invented most astonishing ragout of mushrooms and pot herbs so true is it that the genius of man develops it more particularly under difficult circumstances and that the art of cookery owes perhaps 
the perfection and glory which it has attained to the impediments with which its formidable enemy frugality seems always ready to surround it apicius that profound culinary chemist who nobly expended immense treasures in inventing new dishes and who killed himself because the remainder of his fortune was not sufficient for him though to another it would have seemed magnificent apicius showed us what he believed to be the most suitable manner of preserving vegetables choose them he says before they are perfectly ripe put them in a vessel coated with pitch and cover it hermetically the reader will decide for himself between this process and those which science has since discovered the capillars or statutes of charlemagne enter on the subject of vegetables into some instructive details they inform us that lettuces cresses endive parsley chevrol carrots leeks turnips onions garlic scallions and eschlots were nowhere to be found except in the emperor's kitchen gardens charlemagne had all those vegetables sold and derived from them a very considerable revenue anderson made an observation under the date fifteen forty eight which deserves to be noticed here were it only on account of its singularity the english says he cultivated scarcely any vegetable before the last two centuries at the commencement of the reign of henry the eighth neither salad nor carrots nor cabbages nor radishes nor any other comestibles of a like nature were grown in any part of the kingdom they came from holland and flanders according to the author of a project printed in london in seventeen twenty three in eight v o for the relief of the poor and the payment of old debts without the creation of new taxes queen catherine herself could not procure a salad for her dinner the king was obliged to send over to holland for a gardener to cultivate these pot herbs with which england is perhaps better furnished now than any other country in europe anderson asserts 1660 that cauliflowers were not known in england until about the time of the restoration and lastly the author of the state of england printed in 1768 remarks that asparagus and artichokes were only introduced a few years antecedent to that date end of section 7 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc Section 8 of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophion by Alex Soye. Dried Vegetables. Beans. This innocent vegetable which with us certainly awakens no lugubrious thoughts was formerly consecrated to the dead it was offered in sacrifices to the infernal gods and its mysterious virtues invoked by night spirits and shadows the flamen of jupiter could not eat it and he was forbidden to touch a bean or even to pronounce its name for the fatal plant contains a little black spot which is no other than a noxious character, a type of death. Pythorigus and his followers carefully avoided this dismal food, in the fear of submitting a father, sister, or beloved wife to the danger of a cruel mastication, for who knew where wandering souls might rest during the course of their numerous transmigations? Grave writers say the cause of this abstinence is that beans are difficult of digestion, 
that they stupefy those who make use of them as food and that hens who eat them cease to lay eggs what more shall we say hippocrates wise as he certainly was had some of these strange fears and he trembled for his patience when beans were in blossom in spite of such ridiculous prejudices this plant had numerous and enlightened defenders when green it was served on tables renowned for delicacies and when fully ripe it frequently replaced both wheat and other corn one of the festivals of apollo the pian espia owned its origin and pomp to the bean this vegetable then obtained pre-eminence over all that were boiled in the saucepan and offered to the god of day and the fine arts it is possible to imagine a more brilliant rehabilitation if we are to believe isidorius this plant was the first culinary vegetable of which man made use he was therefore bound to preserve a grateful remembrance of it king david did not deem it unworthy of him and the prophet ezekiel was commanded to mix it with the different grains of which he made his bread we possess few certain indications proving the different culinary combinations to which beans give rise among ancients all we know is that they ate them boiled perhaps with bacon raw with salt as we should imagine or fried with fat butter or oil two kinds especially attracted the attention of true connoisseurs of that class of gourmets elect whose palate is ever testing and whose sure taste detects and appreciates shades of almost imperceptible tenuity first the bean of egypt recommended for its rich nutritious and wholesome pulp this bean was also cultivated in syria and cilicia and secondly the greek bean which passed at rome for a most delicious dish certain gastronomists however preferred another vegetable of which we are going to speak ever since the middle ages the bean has played a very important part of the famous twelfth night cake almost all over europe the the ephemeral royalty it bestowed was often sung by the poets and consecrated in chronicles thomas randolph informs us that lady fleming was queen of the bean in 1568 some days after the duke of guise was assassinated by poltrot history has its puerilities as well as its great tragedies the spaniards had also their twelfth night cake when john duke of bragsna had obtained the crown of portugal 1640 philip the fourth of spain informed count oliveres of the event and added as if it were consolation for the loss of a kingdom that this new sovereign was nothing more than a king of the bean philip was mistaken these cakes were made in former days nearly in the same manner that we make them now sometimes they contained honey flour ginger and pepper one portion was for god another for the holy virgin and three others for the magi that is to say they gave all these portions to the poor in england the cake was often full of raisins among which one bean and one pea were introduced cut the cake says melibius to nyssa who hath the bean shall be king and where the peas is shall be queen at the present day the bean is one of the vegetables most cultivated in egypt and italy at naples as in egypt they are eaten raw when young and the large ones cooked and grilled in the oven they are publicly sold already cooked haricots it is well known that alexander the great was fond of traveling and that he was generally accompanied by his peregrinations by a certain number of soldiers who occasionally took for him 
on his route cities provinces and sometimes kingdoms it happened one day that the macedonian prince worthy pupil of aristotle was herbalizing in india his eyes fell upon a field of haricots which appeared to him very inviting it was the first time he had seen this plant and he immediately ordered his cook to prepare a dish of them we do not know with what sauce but he thought them good and thanks to this great conqueror europe was enriched with a new vegetable virgil was doubtlessly ignorant of this noble origin when he decried haricots severely by qualifying them so disgracefully it was true that the lower classes of people who were very fond of them did great injury to their reputation for things the most exquisite soon lose their value when they fall within the reach of the vulgar it is thus with a pleasing melody when given up to the barbarous and melancholy street organs it ceases to charm the ears of drawing-room fashionables the same again with a plaintive ballad it loses its attraction the moment a street orpheus begins to murder it with his stenorian ball let it not be thought however that the plant of which we speak was exclusively reserved for the vulgar appetite oh no the greeks and latins had too much good taste for that the former allowed it a distinguished place on their tables together with figs and other side dishes they only required that haricots should be young tender and green in rome they were preserved with vinegar and garum and prepared in this manner they excited the appetites of the guests at the beginning of the repast moreover it was admitted that this vegetable was much more wholesome than beans that the stomach was less fatigued by it and that persons of delicate constitutions might partake of it without fear certain amateurs even pretended that no vegetable was to be compared to haricots but others differed from them on this point and the latter right or wrong pronounced in favor of peas peas green peas as we are sorry to say were not appreciated as they deserved to be by the romans it was reserved principally for our century to discover their value to cultivate them with care and to force nature to give them to us before the appointed time this plant was hardly known in fifteen fifty since that period the gardener michaud undertook to bring it into repute for some time in france it was called only by the name of this worthy man before that it was an inappreciated vegetable it came forth blossomed and disappeared without utility and without renown it was not thus with grey peas poi chi which flourished at a very remote period and are mentioned in the sacred writings the common people of rome and greece made them their ordinary food they ate them boiled or fried a rather disagreeable dish according to the caustic marshal who however speaks with disdain of every kind of peas in whatsoever manner they may be prepared nevertheless the satirical humor of this celebrated poet did not prevent this vegetable from being universally sold and men women and children regaled and even gorged themselves with fried grey peas or ram peas caesar eritium a single name for they were indebted to the slight asperity remarkable in each of the grains at the circus and in the theatres they were sold at low price to the spectators whom it seemed impossible to satiate with this delicacy although it has so little attraction for us in short the nation of kings had so decided 
a taste for gray peas that those who coveted public enjoyment did not fail to distribute them gratuitously to the people in order to obtain their suffrages we must acknowledge that in those days votes were obtained at a very cheap rate lentils the egyptians whose ideas were sometimes more eccentric imagined it was sufficient to feed children with lentils to enlighten their minds open their hearts and render them cheerful that people therefore consumed an immense quantity of this vegetable which from infancy had been their principal food the greeks also highly esteemed this aliment and their ancient philosophers regaled themselves with lentils zeno would not trust to any one the cooking of them it is true that the stoics had for their maxim a wise man acts always with reason and prepares his lentils himself we must confess that the great wit of these words escapes us although we are willing to believe there is some in them however it may be lentils were abundant in greece and in the east and many persons otherwise very sensible maintained with the most serious countenance in the world that they softened the temper and disposed the mind to study it is hardly necessary to observe that this plant was well known to the hebrews the red pottage of lentils from which isu sold his birthright the present of shobi to david the victory of shama in the field of lentils and lastly the bread of ezekiel sufficiently proved that the jews numbered this vegetable as one of those in ordinary use among them the romans had not the same esteem for it as the nations we have mentioned according to them the moisture in lentils could only cause heaviness to the mind and render men reserved indolent and lazy the name of this vegetable pretty well shows they said the bad effect it produces lentil derives its origin from the word lentus slow lens a lent and as if enough had not been alleged to disgrace this unfortunate plant and to give the finish to the ill fame it had acquired it was placed among funeral and ill-omened foods thus marcus crassus waging war against the parthenians was convinced that his army would be defeated because his corn was exhausted and his men were obliged to have recourse to lentils how was it possible to resist such attacks the humble plant gave way in spite of the few flattering words of the poetic virgil and the assurance of pliny that this food produced two uncommon virtues mildness and moderation end of section eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section nine of pantrophian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org pantrophian by alexis sawyer kitchen garden part one the art of gardening which may be called the luxury of agriculture was known at the most remote periods in the same enclosure was to be found the kitchen garden orchard and flower garden at a short distance from the habitation of the rich royal hands did not disdain to embellish those spots which afforded a pleasing retreat solitude and repose thus attalus resigned the cares of his crown to cultivate his little garden and sow in it the seeds of his favourite plant babylon the renowned city of antiquity was celebrated amongst the wonders for her gardens suspended in the air they were partly in existence sixteen centuries after their erection and astonished alexander the great by the sublime grandeur of their prodigious boldness and the rare beauty of their workmanship homer has left us the description of alcinous's garden 
from which can be traced the birth of the art of gardening its luxury consisted in the order and symmetry of its form in the richness of its soil the fertility of the trees and in the two fountains which ornamented it it was not so with the romans those conquerors of the world displayed everywhere pomp and ostentation lucullus crassus pompey and caesar filled their gardens with the riches of asia and the spoils of the universe the serious horticulturist who wanted a garden for enjoyment and not for show carefully laboured to see it bring forth fine fruits and excellent vegetables water was properly distributed for irrigation by means of aqueducts of tiles wood or lead pipes and everywhere the plants received the necessary moisture and clever experienced gardeners were constantly occupied in improvements suggested by an attentive and skilful master the kitchen garden of the ancients contained mostly the vegetables herbs and roots of which we still make use but they also cultivated certain other kinds which modern cookery has either put aside or rarely employs we shall describe all those which appear most worthy of notice cabbage this plant has experienced the fate of a host of human things that have not been able to bear the weight of a too brilliant reputation time has done justice to the extraordinary qualities attributed to it and the cabbage now remains what it always ought to have been an estimable vegetable and nothing more the egyptians adored it and raised altars to it they afterwards made of this strange god the first dish of their repasts and were imitated in this particular by the greeks and romans who ascribed to it the happy quality of preserving from drunkenness it was more particularly the red cabbage that obtained these honours and prerogatives from italy the victorious legions introduced it among the gauls as well as the green cabbage the white species appears to belong originally to southern countries hippocrates had a peculiar affection for this vegetable should one of his patients be seized with a violent colic he at once prescribed a dish of boiled cabbage with salt erasistratus looked upon it as a sovereign remedy against paralysis pythagoras and several other learned philosophers composed books in which they celebrated the marvellous virtues of the cabbage a writer not less serious than those we have just quoted the wise cato affirms that this plant infallibly cures all diseases and pretends to have used this panacea to preserve his family from the plague which otherwise would not have failed to reach them it is to the use the romans made of it he adds that they were able during six hundred years to do without the assistance of physicians whom they had expelled from their territories this bold assertion deserved a little retaliation on the part of the faculty so they deposed the cabbage from the rank occupied by it in medicine and banished it to the kitchen the athenian ladies formerly partook of the general enthusiasm in favour of this wholesome vegetable which was always served to them when a newborn infant required their maternal love and care the ancients were acquainted with three principal kinds of cabbage the silken leaved the curled and the hard round white cabbage apicius does not busy himself with any one of these varieties in particular in the various preparations he points out and which we submit to the appreciation of connoisseurs first take only the most delicate and tender part of the cabbage which boil and then pour off the water season it with cumin seed salt old wine oil pepper alisander mint rue coriander seed gravy and oil second prepare the cabbage in the manner just mentioned and make a seasoning of coriander seed onion cumin seed pepper a small quantity of oil and wine made of sun raisins third when you have boiled the cabbages in water put them into a saucepan and stew them with gravy oil wine cumin seed pepper leeks and green coriander fourth add to the preceding ingredients flour of almonds and raisins dried in the sun fifth prepare them again in the above manner and cook them with green olives who will question the service rendered to the culinary art by resuscitating these antique dishes in which the cabbage admits of such a variety of combinations and which we owe to the learning and experience of a man of taste 
whatever may be the opinion of our modern trimalcians we must not forget that this vegetable prepared according to the recipe of apicius was the delight of the gourmets of rome more than eighteen centuries ago the romans brought the red cabbage into gaul and the green cabbage also white cabbages came from the north and the art of making them headed was unknown in the time of charlemagne Quote, in some countries cauliflowers are dried and the white-headed cabbages are preserved the first stripped of their leaves are cut in slices and boiled two minutes in water slightly salted they are shortly after withdrawn and put to drain on hurdles which are afterwards exposed to the sun during two or three days at the expiration of that time the cauliflowers are placed in an oven half warm and are kept there till the stalks are dry they are then wrapped in paper to preserve them from damp to keep the headed cabbages divide them in six or eight pieces according to size throw them for an instant in boiling water then withdraw and plunge them in vinegar which from time to time must be changed especially at the beginning taking care to add always a little salt End quote. Du tour. beet columella pretends that this plant owes its name to its resemblance to the letter b we shall leave it to the professional etymologist the trouble of examining whether columella made a mistake or not the greeks had two distinct sorts of beet the black and the pale they preferred the latter especially when it came from Ascria and boeotia they called this species sicilian beet and the physician diphilus who joined to his knowledge of botany that sort of gastrophagic institution that culinary mont divignon whose inspiration never leads astray placed it far above the cabbage notwithstanding the estimable qualities of this latter vegetable he recommended it to be eaten boiled with mustard and considers this food as a very excellent vermifuge the beet has not found favour with marshall who always caustic and severe calls it an insipid dish this injurious and perhaps unjust epithet would doubtless have exercised a fatal influence upon the destiny of this most inoffensive of vegetables if an opponent of greater weight had not entered the lists against the atrabilarious poet we read in apicius quote, boil over a slow fire some very tender white beet add leeks which have been taken from their native soil some days previous when all this is cooked put it into a saucepan with pepper gravy and raisin wine take care that the ebullition be regular and serve or if you prefer tie in bundles the beet you have carefully chosen wash it throw in some nitre and boil it with water then put it into a saucepan with sun raisin wine pepper cumin and a little oil at the moment of ebullition add a mixture of gravy and coarsely chopped walnuts cover the saucepan for an instant uncover and serve End quote. the skilful artist is pleased for the third time to mention this culinary herb and this is the new preparation which he gives quote, when you have boiled beet in water until it is tender add a pulp of leeks some coriander and cumin seed carefully combined with flour and some made wine place these different ingredients in a saucepan and add gravy oil and vinegar End quote. by tasting one of these dishes you will be convinced that marshall did not understand them or perhaps he composed his epigram after dinner one species of beet is well known in its two principal varieties under the name of beetroot and white beet the southern parts of europe appear to be the native countries of the beet it serves as food for both man and cattle sugar is extracted from the root and potash from the stalks and leaves beetroot is preserved after stripping it completely of its leaves and the earth which remains on them in greenhouses in dry cellars and even in trenches covered with earth in layers lengthwise with sand they are thus preserved until the following may beetroot is eaten cooked in ashes or in water and seasoned in various ways they are excellent in salad either by themselves or mixed with endives or dandelion etc spinach it does not appear that spinach was known to the greeks and romans some authors think that it might be the chrysalocanon of the greeks but it is probable that it was no other than the orach 
Beckman thinks, with several botanists, that this plant came from Spain, and indeed it has been often called the Spanish vegetable. We only speak of this plant by way of memento, and regret that our first matters in cookery have not been able to transmit to us the results of their studies and experience in the preparation of spinach, whose precocity must always render it valuable to amateurs of vegetable food. Mallows. The ancients ate mallows, and recognized in them soothing and softening qualities. Diphilus of Siphne says that their juice lubricates the windpipe, nourishes, and is easily digested. Horace praises this aliment, and Marshall, for once just, recommends its use. It is true that a passage of Cicero would seem to indicate we know not what deception, which appeared all at once when eating or after partaking of mallows, but the Roman orator, perhaps, knew little of the properties of the plant, which were only described much later by Pliny, the naturalist. The curious may consult on this subject the twenty-first chapter of the twentieth book of his great work. At all events, mallows were in high renown. They occupied one of the first ranks among pickles, those famous aceteria, which had so powerful an effect in quickening the appetites of the Greeks, and preparing their stomachs for great gastronomic struggles. They were served as a salad. The large-leaved mallow was mixed with oinagarum, pepper, gravy, and sun-made wine. The small-leaved mallows were also prepared with oinagarum and gravy, but instead of pepper and wine, oil and vinegar were added. Asparagus Quiconque ne voit guer na guer adia osi. But travellers, those daring pioneers of science, have sometimes in their travels the strange good fortune to behold wonders invisible to other eyes. Thus some skilful explorators of Africa saw, about the middle of the second century of the Christian era, in Getulia, asparagus of excellent quality and of very beautiful growth, being no less than twelve feet high. It is needless to add, that the Libyan vendors rarely sold them in bundles, but these veridical travellers, on quitting the plain to ascend the mountains, found something still more wonderful. The land there seemed to suit these plants still better, for they acquired the height of twenty cubits. After this, what shall we say of our European asparagus, so shrivelled and diminutive in comparison with that of Getulia? The Greeks, not having any better, contented themselves with the ordinary sort, such as we have at the present day. They considered it very useful in the treatment of internal diseases. Diphilus, who was very fond of it, regrets that this vegetable should be so hurtful to the sight. Is it because we eat asparagus that spectacles have become necessary at nearly all periods of life? The Romans cultivated this plant with extreme care, and obtained the most extraordinary results. At Ravenna, they raised asparagus, each stem of which weighed three pounds. Then, as in our days, they were allowed but a short time to boil, hence the favourite expression of Augustus, who, to intimate his wish that any affair might be included without delay, was accustomed to say, "'Let that be done quicker than you would cook asparagus.' The cooks of Rome had a method which appears to have been subsequently too much neglected. They chose the finest heads of asparagus and dried them. When wanted for the table, they put them into hot water and then boiled them a few minutes. Thanks to this simple process, the plant swelled considerably and passed as being very tender and fine-flavoured. The Apicii, Lucili, and other connoisseurs of renown had this vegetable brought from the environs of Nisus, a city of Campania. It is asserted that Asia is its native soil, and that it was originally brought to us from that part of the world. Nevertheless, wild asparagus grows naturally in certain sandy soils, as, for instance, in the islands of the Rhone and the Loire. Quote, when it is found impossible to eat all the asparagus you have cut, and which has arrived at a convenient maturity, Place them by the thick ends in a vessel containing about two inches of water, or else bury them halfway up in fresh sand. By means of these precautions, asparagus may be preserved several days. End quote. Parmentier. Good. This vegetable, which the wise gourmet is too discreet to despise, and to which the whimsical fancy of Roman gardeners gave the most grotesque forms, 
appears to be the very image of those soft and easy dispositions who yield to and obey every one and whose unintelligent mildness is only repaid with sarcasm or disdain observe this creeping vegetable left free to grow to its full size which would sometimes attain the length of nine feet and which the will of man was able to reduce to the slender and tortuous shape of a hideous dragon when hardly ripe it was cut and served on the tables of the most dainty where it was eaten with vinegar and mustard or seasoned with fine herbs and whilst the ungrateful guests savoured the stomachic and nourishing flesh of the gourd they did not cease to amuse themselves at the expense of its round and almost empty body the proverbial image of a head not over well provided with brains to the present day even more than one popular joke continues to pursue this plant although its culinary qualities are appreciated as formerly we are indebted to india for the seed of the gourd which the greeks designated according to the species by the names of indian and common gourd the latter kind was either boiled or roasted the former was generally boiled in water antioch furnished the finest specimens to the markets of athens the ancients were acquainted with the manner of preserving this vegetable in such a state of freshness as to enable them to eat it with pleasure in the month of january the method is as follows the gourds were cut in pieces of a moderate size these pieces strung like beads were first dried in the open air and then smoked when winter arrived each piece was well washed before putting it into the stew pan with the various culinary herbs which the season produced to this was added endive curled cabbage and dried mushrooms the rest of the operation is easily understood the romans prepared this vegetable in different ways a few of the principal ones will suffice first boil the gourd in water squeeze it out carefully place it in a saucepan and mix some pepper a little cumin seed rue gravy vinegar and a small quantity of wine reduced to one half by boiling let the whole stew and then sprinkle it lightly with pepper and serve second boil and carefully squeeze them to extract the water then put the gourds into a saucepan with vinegar and gravy when it begins to simmer thicken with fine flour sprinkle lightly with pepper and serve third throw some salt on the gourd after it has been boiled and the water pressed out of it put it into a saucepan with a mixture of pepper cumin seed coriander green mint and the root of benzoin add some vinegar then chop some dates and almonds a little later more vinegar honey gravy sun-made wine and oil sprinkle lightly with pepper and serve fourth put into a stew pan a fowl with a gourd add some apricots truffles pepper cumin sylphium mint parsley coriander pennyroyal and calamint moisten with wine gravy oil vinegar and honey these four recipes are sufficient to prove that this vegetable stood very high in the estimation of the romans turnips the epicureans of athens preferred turnips brought from thebes roman gastronomists placed those of amitermes in the first rank and those of nursia in the second the kitchen gardeners of rome furnished them with a third variety to which they had recourse when they could not procure any other they were eaten boiled thus after the water had been extracted from them they were seasoned with cumin rue benzoin pounded in a mortar adding to it afterwards honey vinegar gravy boiled grapes and a little oil the whole was left to simmer and then served carrots the greek and romans planted or sowed them in the beginning of the spring or autumn they distinguished two kinds the wild and the cultivated this much esteemed root received the honour of being prepared in many ways sometimes it was eaten as a salad with salt oil and vinegar it was also stewed and mixed afterwards with inagarum again they boiled it in a stew pan over a slow fire with some cumin and a little oil and just before serving it was sprinkled with ground cumin seeds blit a sort of beet blit is one of the family of atroplices which grows in europe and in the temperate regions of asia it owes its ancient reputation entirely to the insipidity 
of its flavour from which it derives its greek name synonymous with stupidity and insignificance blit was eaten boiled when nothing better was to be had in fact it was a last resource and nothing more purslane this vegetable the aspect of which lead us to suppose it possessed savoury qualities though experience proves the contrary was formerly mixed in different salads and still enjoys some esteem when associated with a leg of mutton in default of esculent qualities which it certainly does not possess the ancients recognised in purslane many admirable virtues which are not acknowledged in the present day the internal use of this plant also its external application cured the bite of serpents wounds inflicted by poisoned arrows and infallibly neutralized the effects of poisonous drinks that alas purslane is not now what it was formerly for it is hardly permitted to appear by the side of one of our fresh white lettuces sorrel sorrel is a polygenous plant and grows throughout europe amidst the grass fields the romans cultivated it in order to give it more vigour and ate it sometimes stewed with mustard and seasoned with a little oil and vinegar broccoli drusus son of tiberius was so passionately fond of the broccoli which apicius induced him to eat that he was more than once severely reprimanded by his father on the subject it is true that the celebrated roman epicurean displayed so much art and gave such delicious flavour to it that this dish alone would have been enough to establish his reputation in fact broccoli has always been appreciated by connoisseurs and glaucius who passed his life in meditating seriously on the perfectibility of culinary ingredients said quote, that nothing could be better than this vegetable boiled and suitably seasoned End quote. this was the method of preparing it at rome they used only the most tender and delicate parts of the broccoli which were boiled with that extreme care the artist always devotes to this first operation and afterwards when the water had been well drained off they added some cumin seed pepper chopped onions and coriander seed all braised together not forgetting before serving up to add a little oil and some made wine artichoke a young and unfortunate beauty had the ill luck to displease a vindictive and irascible god who instantly metamorphosed her into an artichoke this poor girl's name was sinara although she had become a bitter plant she preserved this sweet name which the moderns have strangely modified our readers who eat artichokes with so much indifference will perhaps sometimes lament this poor victim of a blind resentment this plant was well known to the ancients the hilly regions of greece asia and egypt were covered with it but the inhabitants made no use of it as an aliment and it remained uncultivated it would be rather difficult to trace the precise period when it was first introduced into italy all we know is that it grew there more than half a century before the christian era in the time of dioscorides who mentioned it it appears nevertheless that hardly any one troubled himself about artichokes or their esculent qualities up to that time but the wealthy about a century after began to appreciate them and pliny in one of his jesting whims reproaches the rich with having deprived the lower classes and asses of a food which nature seemed to have destined for them this vegetable was then very dear for it did not succeed and was subsequently given up it was so far forgotten that in the year fourteen seventy three it appeared as a novelty in venice and towards the year fourteen sixty five it was brought from naples to florence whence it passed into france in the sixteenth century galen looked upon the artichoke as a bad food columella sung its praises in his verses he recommended it to his, the disciples of bacchus and forbid the use of it to those who were anxious to preserve a sweet and pure voice this plant whatever may be in other respects its estimable qualities does not please every one equally well its bitterness and unpleasant odour keep it at a distance from numerous palates perhaps because too many allow themselves to be prejudiced by deceitful appearances here are two very ingenious methods by means of which a trial might be made to overcome or lessen the defects it undoubtedly has and which we can but deplore artichokes will become mild by taking care to steep the seed 
in a mixture of honey and milk they will then exhale the most agreeable perfume particularly when this seed has passed three days in the juice of bay leaves lilies or roses having quoted the authority we give the recipe for what it is worth until the result of this experiment is known artichokes may be eaten raw with a seasoning of hard eggs chopped in very small pieces garum and oil if you prefer a sharper sauce mix well some green mint with rue greek fennel and coriander add afterwards some pepper alisander honey garum and oil they are also eaten boiled with cumin pepper gravy and oil Quote, it is well known under what form artichokes either raw or cooked appear on our tables the best way to preserve them is to half cook them separate the leaves from the fur and preserve the fleshy part called the bottom and throw them still warm in cold water to make them firm that operation is called blanchir they are laid afterwards on hurdles and put four different times in the oven as soon as the bread is taken out they become then very thin hard and transparent like horn and return to their original form in hot water they must be kept free from damp End quote. Parmentier. Pompion. Like the gourd, the good and creeping pompion has served more than once as a term of comparison, and that in a style most humiliating. Should any one happen to be thick headed or not very intelligent, he was immediately compared to a pompion, popularly pumpkin, whence bumpkin. The insult went still further it was said of a pusillanimous man that he had a pompion where his heart ought to have been the obesity of this vegetable and its inelegant shape have doubtless given rise to these injurious remarks it was however acknowledged that it possessed many estimable qualities which ought to have compensated for its outward defects it was thought to be very refreshing and was employed with success in the treatment of diseases of the eyes we might undertake, if permitted, a long dissertation in order to prove that the Hebrews, weary of being in the desert, murmured because they were deprived of the pompion in Egypt, and not the melon, as translators has rendered it. But we should be accused of egregious presumption, the learned would frown, critics would not spare us, and our pompions would, nevertheless, pass as melons. This plant occupies a prominent place in the precious catalogue of Roman dainties, which we offer for the meditation of judges here are some of the ancient modes of preparing this vegetable first boil some pompions put them in a stew pan with cumin and a little oil place them for a short time over a slow fire and serve second when you have well boiled reduce them to a pulp then put them on a dish with pepper alisander cumin wild margarine onion wine garum and oil thicken with flour and serve third when the pompion has boiled in water it is then seasoned with wild fennel sylphian dried mint vinegar and garum end of section nine section ten of pantrophian this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pantrophian by Alexis Sawyer Kitchen Garden Part 2 Cucumber When the Israelites were in the desert, they regretted much the cucumbers of Egypt, which were sold to them at a very trifling price when under the yoke of Pharaoh. We may thence infer that this vegetable was very plentiful, and chiefly in great demand by the lower order of people, for as the Jews were in a state of servitude, they were necessarily assimilated with the most abject of the Egyptians. We see that this cucurbitacea has long been known, and that, after the lapse of many centuries, it is held in the same degree of estimation it enjoyed amongst the eastern nations. The Greeks thought much of the cucumber, particularly of that kind which came from the environs of Antioch. 
they attributed to this plant marvellous properties which modern scepticism has completely thrown aside we think it good in salad with vinegar oil pepper and salt and that is all it is we imagine the only good quality our farmers ascribe to it at the present day formerly in greece the same class of persons being clearer sighted or more credulous were convinced that this vegetable protected all kinds of seeds against the voracity of insects to obtain this result it was only necessary to steep the seed in the juice obtained from the root of the cucumber before it was sown we freely offer this preservative to those who may wish to give it a trial and sincerely hope they may profit by this revival of the greek process the romans conceived that this cold and somewhat insipid vegetable we beg pardon of its admirers required a seasoning to heighten its flavour no sooner had they transplanted it from asia to rome than they busied themselves in rendering it worthy of their tables by various preparations which may perhaps interest the curious first scrape the cucumbers and eat them with inagarum or prepare the condiment with thyme wild mint pepper and alisander to which add as before garum oil and honey second scrape the cucumbers and boil them with parsley seed gravy and oil thicken and sprinkle pepper over the dish before serving third again they may be seasoned with pepper pennyroyal honey or sun made wine gravy vinegar and a little sylphium fourth you will obtain a most delicate dish by boiling the cucumbers with brains already cooked adding afterwards some cumin and a little honey the cucumber although but little nutritious does not agree with cold stomachs in the north an astonishing quantity are consumed the poles ate them at every repast with boiled meat Quote, cucumbers are preserved in a very simple manner the essential point is to obtain good wine vinegar after having well washed and wiped them put them into either white or red vinegar the colour is better preserved by adding the white add salt cover simply the vessel containing them with a board the vinegar must always be an inch higher than the cucumbers and must be entirely renewed at the end of a month end quote parmentier lettuce from time immemorial the lettuce has occupied a most distinguished place in the kitchen garden the hebrews ate it without preparation with the paschal lamb the opulent greeks were very fond of the lettuces of smyrna which appeared on their tables at the end of a repast the romans who at first imitated them decided under domitian that this favourite dish should be served in the first course with eggs purposely to excite their indomitable appetites which three courses and such courses ye god when compared with ours of the present day would hardly satisfy the bitter lettuce was sufficient for the frugal hebrews but the delicate epicureans of athens and rome were much more particular they valued them only when a mild and sweet savour invited the most rebellious palate and awakened the slumbering desires of a fatigued stomach and what care what attention did they not bestow on the growth and maturity of this cherished plant aristoxenus a philosopher by profession an epicurean by taste had in his garden a species of lettuce which was the envy of his surrounding neighbours the worthy man rendered happy by their jealous admiration went every evening without fail to contemplate the small square of ground which contained his treasure and sprinkled it carefully with water doubtless from a limpid stream tush water to moisten the lettuces of aristoxenus no the philosopher kept in reserve a sweet and excellent wine to quench the thirst of his plants and to communicate to them that delicate perfume and exquisite taste the mysterious cause of which baffled the neighbouring gastronomists the day after the arch old man would say with a roguish smile that he was going to gather some relishing green cakes 
which the earth prepared expressly for him and the simple countrymen were wonderstruck without understanding the cause the lettuce favourite plant of the beautiful adonis possesses a narcotic virtue of which ancient physicians have taken notice galen mentions that in his old age he had not found a better remedy against the wakefulness he was troubled with the biographer of augustus informs us that this emperor being attacked with hypochondria recovered only by the use of lettuces recommended by musa his first physician nothing therefore is wanting in praise of this useful plant literally nothing since the king of cooks coelius apicius judged it worthy of an honourable place in the immortal book he has bequeathed to the amateurs of the archaeologico culinary science of all ages and all countries take says he the leaves of lettuces let them be boiled with onions in water wherein you have put some nitre take them out squeeze out the water and cut them in small pieces mix well some pepper alisander parsley seed dried mint and onions put this mixture to the lettuce and add to the whole some gravy oil and wine lettuces may also be eaten with a dressing of gravy and pickles our ancestors served salads with roasted meat roasted poultry etc they had a great many which are now no longer in vogue they ate leeks cooked in the wood ashes and seasoned with salt and honey borage mint and parsley with salt and oil lettuce fennel mint chervil parsley and elderflowers mixed together they also classed among their salads an agglomeration of feet heads coxcombs and fowls livers cooked and seasoned with parsley mint vinegar pepper and cinnamon nettles and the twigs of rosemary formed delicious salads for our forefathers and to these they sometimes added pickled gherkins endive pliny assures us that the juice of this plant mixed with vinegar and oil of roses is an excellent remedy for the headache we leave to the proper judges a pharmaceutical mixture which does not belong to our province and which we only quote en passant virgil thought endive bitter but he did not speak ill of it columella recommended this salad to fastidious and satiated palates this is praising it the egyptians appreciated its merits which the greeks had too much sense and good taste to disdain and the romans ate it prepared in the following manner choose some fine endive wash it well drain off all the water add a little gravy and oil then chop some onions very small strew them over the endive and add honey and vinegar it is understood that the sweet savour of the honey corrects the bitterness of the plant but a judicious attention must preside over the quantity of that substance for too much or too little might easily spoil this salad of apicius onions whoever wishes to preserve his health must eat every morning before breakfast young onions with honey such a treat is assuredly not very tempting besides this rather strong vegetable leaves after it a most unpleasant perfume which long reminds us of its presence wherefore this recipe has not met with favour and indeed it is much to be doubted whether it will ever become fashionable alexander the great found the onion in egypt where the hebrews had learned to like it he brought it into greece where it was given as food to the troops whose martial ardour it was thought to excite pliny assures us that gaul produced a small kind which the romans called gallic onions and which they thought more delicate than those of italy at any rate it was a dish given up to plebeians and the poor horace opposed to it fish the luxurious nourishment of rich and dainty romans in spite of this reprobation on the part of the elegant poet apicius does not fear to introduce the plant in his olus mole a kind of julienne not devoid of merit take onions rather dry and mix pepper alisander and winter savoury to season a variety of vegetables previously boiled in water and nitre and which when very fine thicken with cullis oil and wine 
leeks this vegetable a powerful divinity dreaded among the egyptians and a food bewailed by the israelites in their journey through the desert cured the greeks of numerous diseases which in our days it is to be feared would resist its medicinal properties everything changes in this sublunary world and the leek no doubt follows the common law the authors of a compilation rather indigestible at times but often very curious assert that this vegetable attains its extraordinary size by putting as many of the seeds as one can take up with three fingers into a piece of linen which is then to be tied up covered with manure and watered with care all these seeds so they say will at last form themselves into one single seed which will produce a monstrous leek this process which is revealed to us by the geoponics would have had an enthusiastic reception from those fervent pagans who vied in zeal with each other to see who could offer latona on the day of the theoxenias the most magnificent leek the mother of apollo received this plant with pleasure although presented to her quite raw but she would probably have preferred it dressed in the following manner take leeks the mildest it is possible to procure boil them in water and oil with a handful of salt and put them into a dish with gravy and wine or cover the leeks with young cabbage leaves cook them under the hot embers and season afterwards as above melon this cucurbitacea the most delicate vegetable belonging to this numerous family has always been the delight of the inhabitants of the east and of europe it came originally from the most temperate regions of asia the chivalric barber made it known to his hindu subjects and the romans introduced it into the west at the time of their first expedition against the persians melons had a prodigious success at rome and soon became a necessity with which the wealthy could not dispense the emperor tiberius that cruel and covetous prince liked them so much that they were served to him every day throughout the year the greeks whose ingenious and lively imagination mingled with everything the sweet perfume of flowers contrived to place the seeds of melons in vessels full of rose leaves in which they were afterwards sown they maintained that when at maturity this cool and refreshing vegetable was impregnated with sweet emanations and that its flavour called to mind its sweet and delicious abode with the queen of flowers sometimes also they macerated the seeds in milk and honey not only melons but all the cucurbitaceae were treated in the same manner when it was wished to communicate to them a milder flavour in pointing out these processes in use among the ancient horticulturists we do not at all pledge ourselves for their efficacy however it must be acknowledged that they exhibit a singularly praiseworthy emulation which has perhaps prepared the way for the wonders with which our modern gardeners have made us familiar independently of its exquisite flavour the melon passed among the greeks and romans as being very beneficial to the stomach and head it is possible that they may have gone a little too far but then man is so ready to give imaginary qualities to what he loves that we cannot wonder at their praises of this delicious plant which we generally eat in the most simple manner without any other seasoning than a little sugar sometimes with salt and pepper not so with the romans their practised palates required a more exquisite combination they therefore added to it a sharp savoury sauce a compound of pepper pennyroyal honey or sun-made wine garum vinegar and sylphium melons were not known in central or northern europe until the reign of charles the eighth king of france who brought them from italy radish amongst other singularities which abound in the talmud the curious can but have remarked the following judea formerly produced kitchen garden plants so large that a fox bethought himself to hollow a radish and make it his residence after he had removed this new kind of lair was discovered it was put into a scale and found to weigh nearly one hundred pounds 
it is a pity that no one preserved the seed of so remarkable a vegetable which no doubt was only to be found in judea the greeks had very fine radishes but they were not of such a surprising size they procured them from the territory of mantinea mount algadea also furnished the romans with an excellent kind but which they esteemed less highly than those of nursia in the country of the sabines these latter cost about three pence a pound at the time of pliny they were sold for double that sum when the crop was not abundant writers of antiquity notice three distinct kinds of radishes the large short and thick the round and the wild they fancied that at the end of three years the seed of this plant produced very good cabbages which must have been rather vexatious at times to honest gardeners who might have preferred radishes in times of popular tumult this root was often transformed into an ignominious projectile with which the mob pursued persons whose political opinions rendered them obnoxious to the majority as we might say in the present day as soon as calm was re-established the insulting vegetable was placed in the pot to boil and afterwards eaten with oil and a little vinegar the romans preserved radishes very well by covering them with a paste composed of honey vinegar and salt horseradish by apollo cried mournfully a philanthropic and gastronomic greek we must be completely mad to buy horseradish when fish can be found in the market so thought the philosopher amphis and at rome as in greece this reviled and despised root hardly found a place on the table of the poor when anything else could be had there were several serious causes for this fatal prescription this plant was found to be bitter stringy and of difficult digestion it was looked upon as a very common food the lowest class alone dared to feed upon it the opulent were therefore compelled to exclude it from the number of their dishes and again certain strange customs authorized by the roman law contributed greatly to make the horseradish an object of horror and detestation so true it is that the manner in which objects are associated with our ideas determines almost invariably our love or hatred for them nevertheless all the species of this vegetable and there were five in number distinctly mentioned by theophrastus ought not to have been condemned so severely the corinthian the leothasian the cleonian the amorean and the boeotian were so many distinct and separate species each of which possessed its own peculiar property and quality the last named with its large and silky leaves was tender and had a sweet agreeable taste the others not so good perhaps were wholesome and nourishing and their natural bitterness never failed to disappear when the seeds were allowed to soak for some time in sweet or raisin wine before they were sown shall we now mention the properties the horseradish possessed and which ought to have been sufficient to establish its reputation if prejudice were not both deaf and blind take fasting some pieces of this beneficent and despised root and the most inveterate poisons will be changed for you into inoffensive drinks would you have the power to handle and play with those dangerous reptiles whose active venom causes a speedy and sure death wash your hands in the juice of horseradish do you seek an efficacious remedy for the numerous evils which besiege us unceasingly take horseradish nothing but horseradish it is true that this incomparable root attacks the enamel of the teeth and indeed soon spoils them but why should we be so particular when so many marvellous properties are in question as to its culinary preparation apicius recommends us to serve it mixed with pepper and garum garlic garlic was known in the most remote ages it was a god in egypt the greeks held it in horror it was part of their military food hence came the proverb eat neither garlic nor beans that is to say abstain from war and law there was a belief that this plant excited the courage of warriors therefore it was given to cocks to incite them to fight 
the greek and roman sailors made as great a use of it as the soldiers and an ample provision was always made when they set out on any maritime expedition it was a prevailing opinion that the effects of foul air were neutralized by garlic and it was no doubt this idea which made reapers and peasants use it so lavishly however the taste for this vegetable was not always confined to the people in the southern countries of europe it gained at times the high regions of the court it is reported that in thirteen sixty eight alfonso king of castile who had an extreme repugnance to garlic instituted an order of knighthood and one of the statutes was that any knight who had eaten of this plant could not appear before the sovereign for at least one month the priests of Cybele interdicted the entry of the temple of this goddess to persons who had made use of garlic stilfon troubling himself very little about this interdiction fell asleep on the steps of the altar the mother of the gods appeared to him in his dream and reproached him with the little respect his breath disclosed for her if you wish me to abstain from garlic replied stilfon give me something else to eat the ancients great lovers of the marvellous believed that this despised vegetable possessed a sovereign virtue against the greater number of diseases and that it was easy to deprive it of its penetrating odour by sowing and gathering it when the moon was below the horizon the greek and roman cooks used it but very seldom and it was only employed as a second or third-rate ingredient in some preparations of apicius which we shall hereafter mention Quote, garlic is called a physic of the peasantry especially in warm countries where it is eaten before going to work in order to guarantee them from the pernicious effects of foul air it would be too long were we to relate all that has been written in favour of this vegetable let it suffice to say that it is employed in numerous pharmaceutical preparations and among others in vinegar celebrated by the name of aromatic vinegar End quote. Bosque. Echelots. Alexander the Great found the echelot in Phoenicia and introduced it into Greece. Its Latin name, Ascalonica, indicates the place of its origin, Ascalon, a city of Idumea. Its affinity with garlic set the ancients against its culinary qualities, and this useful plant, too much neglected, only obtained credit in modern times parsley hercules the conqueror of the nemean lion crowned himself with parsley a rather modest adornment for so great a hero when others for exploits much less worthy were decked with laurels a similar crown became subsequently the prize of the nemean and isthmian games anacreon that amiable and frivolous poet who consecrated all his moments to pleasure celebrates parsley as the emblem of joy and festivity and horace a philosophic sensualist of the same stamp commanded his banqueting hall to be ornamented with roses and parsley perhaps it was thought that the strong penetrating odour of parsley possessed the property of exciting the brain to agreeable imaginations if so it explains the fact of its being worn by guests placed round their heads fable has made it the food of juno's coursers in battle the warriors of homer fed their chargers with it and melancholy taking it for the symbol of mourning admitted it to the dismal repasts of obsequies let us seek to discover in this plant qualities less poetic and less brilliant but assuredly more real and positive in the first place wash some parsley with the roots adhering dry it well in the sun boil it in water and leave it a while on the side then put into a saucepan some garlic and leeks which must boil together a long time and very slowly until reduced to two-thirds that done pound some pepper mix it with gravy and a little honey strain the water in which the parsley was boiled and pour it over the parsley with the whole of the other ingredients put the stew pan once more on the fire and serve the following recipe is much less complicated and more expeditious 
boil the parsley in water with nitre press out all the water cut it very fine then mix with care some pepper alisander marjoram and onions add some wine gravy and oil stew the whole with some parsley in an earthen pot or stew pan if the illustrious pupil of chiron the warlike achilles had known the culinary properties of parsley as well as he knew its medicinal virtues he no doubt would have been less prodigal with it for his horses and the conquerors of troy would have comforted themselves during the tediousness of a long siege by cooking this aromatic plant and enjoying a new dish parsley according to some writers was of egyptian origin but it is not known who brought it into sardinia where it was found by the carthaginians who afterwards made it known to the inhabitants of marseilles Cherville, this plant which columella has described furnished a relishing dish prepared with gravy oil and wine or served with fried fish at the present day it is highly commendable in salad watercresses the watercress the sight alone of which made the learned scaliger shudder with terror is supposed to be a native of crete it was doubtless the cresses of aelan swabia which are cultivated in our gardens and not those commonly found in brooks and springs the persians were in the habit of eating them with bread they made in this manner so delicious a meal that the splendour of a syracusian table would not have tempted them this is one of those examples of sobriety which may be admired but are seldom followed plutarch did not share the opinion of the persians but scornfully ranked cresses amongst the lowest elements of the people nevertheless the romans as well as the greeks granted to this cruciform plant a host of beneficent qualities and among others a singularly refreshing property refreshing to say the truth it refreshes much in the same way that mustard and pepper do boiled in goat's milk it cured thoracic affections introduced into the ears it relieved the toothache and finally persons who made it their habitual food found their wits sharpened and their intelligence more active and ingenious however it does not appear that cresses ever enjoyed in rome or athens a culinary vogue equal to their officinal reputation it was said that its acrid taste twisted the nose and this coarse jest naturally did it harm to a certain degree with the rich and delicate be that as it may those who dared ate it dressed in the following manner with garum or oil and vinegar or with pepper cumin seed and lentiscus leaves of the mastic tree the watercress par excellence grows in springs rivulets and ditches in europe its piquant taste is rather agreeable it is eaten as a salad or seasoning with poultry and other roasted meat this plant increases the appetite fortifies the stomach and possesses antiscorbutic qualities a great consumption is made of it in certain countries it is cultivated in running waters either in gardens or sown in the shade where it is watered abundantly the less it sees the sun the softer it is bosk End of section 10. Section 11 of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophion by Alex Soyer Plants Used in Seasoning We will point out, as briefly as possible, those plants mostly used in the kitchens of the ancients to heighten the flavor of their dishes or to give them a particular taste, according as the dish or fancy might require it. In them especially lies the secret of those irritamia gulfs or excitements of the palate which apicius brought so much into fashion 
poppy the seed of this plant was offered fried at the beginning of the second course and eaten with honey sometimes it was sprinkled on the crust of a kind of household bread covered with white of eggs some of it was also put into the panda or pap intended for children perhaps to make them sleep the sooner sesame this seed was used in nearly the same manner as the poppy and it occupied a distinguished rank among the numerous dainties served at dessert certain round and light cakes were covered with this seed the romans brought sesame from egypt sow thistle this plant furnished a kind of milk which was sometimes drunk sometimes various kinds of meat were seasoned with it it was afterwards given up to rabbits and there is every probability that they will retain undisputed possession of it orac few vegetables have been more exposed to injurious accusations pythorgus reproaches it with causing a livid paleness dropsy and the scrofula in those persons who eat it nevertheless a greedy curiosity introduced it into the catalogue of culinary preparations and the guests of apicius tasted more than once the fatal orac without knowing its pernicious properties history does not say that they suffered any pernicious effects from it this plant is also eaten like spinach and mixed with sorrel to soften its acidity rocket persons about to undergo the punishment of the whip were recommended to swallow a cup of wine in which rocket had been steeped it was asserted that this draw rendered pain supportable and again that this plant taken with honey removed the freckles which sometimes appear on the face whatever may be the degree of credence accorded to these two recipes this vegetable enjoyed some reputation among the ancients who mixed the wild and the garden rocket together so as to temper the heat of the one by the coldness of the other fennel it was employed but seldom in the preparation of dishes or pastry but it was believed that the juice of its stalk had the property of restoring or strengthening the sight dill this plant which according to the ancients weakened the eyes was much renowned for its exquisite odor and its stomatic qualities a much admired perfume was made from it it produced an agreeable sort of wine or liqueur and a small number of choice dishes for the enjoyment of connoisseurs owed to it the reputation they had acquired anise seed the production of an umbiferous plant which grows wild in egypt in syria and other eastern countries pliny recommends it to be taken in the morning with honey and myrrh in wine and pythagoras attributes it to eminent hygiene properties whether eaten raw or cooked hyssop the greeks the romans and before them the nations of the east believed that hyssop renews and purifies the blood this plant mixed with equal quantity of salt formed a remedy much extolled by columbia it was crushed with oil to make a liniment used as a remedy for cutaneous eruptions an excellent liqueur was obtained from it known under the name of hyssop wine and lastly this plant was used in a number of dishes which it rendered more wholesome and refreshing wild marjoram nearly the same qualities were attributed to this herb as to hyssop and it was employed still more frequently in the composition of the most delicate condiments discordes 
and cato made copious remarks on a much esteemed liqueur which they called wild marjoram wine savory an odiferous herb which entered into the seasoning of nearly every dish thyme besides the various culinary purposes for which the ancients used this plant they like ourselves extracted from thyme aromatic liqueurs the preparation of which will be given in another part of this work wild thyme we find it rarely spoken of by magiric writers pliny believes it to be most efficacious against the bite of serpents sweet marjoram was much employed in the isle of cyprus very little if at all in rome where they knew little more of sweet marjoram than the oil extracted from it penny royal the ancients entwined their wine caps with penny royal and made crowns of it which were placed on their heads during their repasts by the aid of which they hoped to escape the troublesome consequences of too copious libations on leaving the table a small quantity of this plant was taken to facilitate digestion penny royal occupied also an important place in high gastronomic combinations rue the territory of myra a city of lycia produced excellent rue mithridates looked upon this vegetable as a powerful counter poison and the inhabitants of hercule suspicious and with reason of the villainy of their tyrant clearchus never stirred from their dwellings without having previously eaten plentifully of rue this plant cured also the earache and to all these advantages it joined that of being welcomed with honor on all festive occasions mint there was formerly no matter where or when a beautiful young girl who was changed into this plant through the jealous vengeance of prosperine thus transformed she excited the appetite of the guests and awakened their slumbering gaiety mint prevented milk from curdling even when rennet was put into it spanish chamomile the romans sometimes mixed with their drink the burning root of the spanish chamomile and we are astonished at meeting with the name of this formidable plant among the ingredients of some of their dishes cumin the condiments prepared with cumin had a very great reputation and culinary authors frequently mention this vegetable which the greeks and romans invariably used alisander the same might be said of alisander which in the time of pliny passed as a universal remedy and which apicius honors by naming in many of his dishes capers young buds of the caper tree a shrub native of asia where the species are in great varieties it was but little thought of at the tables of the higher classes and therefore was left to the people the buds of the caper are gathered and thrown into barrels filled with vinegar to which a little salt is added then by means of several large sieves made of a copper plate rather hollow and pierced with holes of different sizes the different qualities are separated and classed under different numbers the vinegar is renewed and the capers are replaced in the barrel ready for exportation asafoetia this plant which we have excluded from our kitchens and whose nauseous smell is far from exciting the appetite reigned almost as the chief ingredient in the seasoning of the ancients perhaps they cultivated a kind which in no way resembled that of modern times 
if it were the same how are we to explain the extreme partiality which apicius shows for it and which he says must be dissolved in lukewarm water and afterwards served with vinegar and garum it is certainly that the resin drawn from by incision from the root of this plant is still much esteemed by the inhabitants of persia and of india they chew it constantly finding the odor and taste exquisite the neck of the root is cleared of the earth it is covered with and replaced by a handful of herbs at the end of forty days the summit of the root is out transversely then a small bundle of herbs is laid over so as not to touch it a whitish liqueur excludes from the cut and every other day it is gathered the cut is renewed until the root is quite exhausted the result of this crop is laid on leaves and dried in the sun sumac the romans made use of the seed to flavor several kinds of dishes ginger this root was known at rome under the emperors and many persons have confounded ginger with pepper although they in no way resemble each other pliny refutes this error and represents it as a native of arabia it was used with other condiments the indians grate this root in their broth or ragu they make a paste which they believe is good against the scurvy the inhabitants of madagascar eat it green in salad cut in small pieces and mixed with other herbs which they season with salt oil and vinegar in other places ginger is taken infused as a drink it fortifies the chest and awakens the appetite it is preserved in sugar after it has been stripped of its bark and soaked in vinegar delicious preserves are made of it with much perfume and which keep a very long time wormwood the egyptians had a great respect for the wormwood of taposiris no doubt on account of the medicinal properties which physicians attributed to it heliogabalus often regaled the populace with wormwood wine and the romans gave it to the victorious charioteers pliny thinks this plant so salutary that nothing more precious could have been presented to them this explanation appears to have had but little plausibility and it has been more rationally supposed that this liqueur prevented or counteracted any giddiness they might feel you can cure yourself of dizziness says strabo with the bitter leaf of wormwood the roman wormwood wine was composed in the following manner they bruised one ounce of this vegetable and mixed it with three scruples of gum as much spikenard six of balm and three scruples of saffron to which was added eighteen setiers or one hundred and eighty gallons english of old wine this mixture was left to stand some time but was not heated or subjected to any other process in pharmacy wine is made of wormwood also a syrup a preserve an extract oil by infusion an essential oil and wormwood salt it is supposed that several brewers on the continent substitute the leaves and flowers of this plant for hops in the manufacture of beer it is perhaps a calumny and we only repeat it in a whisper the leaves of wormwood are used in salad to make it more digestible and heighten the flavor they are preserved in vinegar and to season dishes lastly they are considered by some persons as a remedy and the frequent use of them to be indispensable for the preservation of their existence in concluding this chapter it will be necessary to anticipate a question 
which naturally presents itself did the romans know the art of forcing fruits and of procuring at one season the various vegetables or plants which belong to another period of the year some verses from marshall will leave no doubt on the subject whoever has seen the orchards of king corcyrus alcinius dear antilius must have preferred thy rural habitation thou knowest how to preserve from the rigours of winter the purple grapes of thy vine bower and prevent the cold frost from devouring the gifts of bacchus thy grapes live enclosed under a transparent crystal which covers without concealing them what can a vicarious nature refuse to the industry of man sterile winter is constrained to give up the fruits of autumn this curious passage gives us to understand that the romans had hot houses and no doubt glass bells in their orchards and gardens to bring sooner to maturity some of those productions of the earth which by their delicate flavor and perfume raise the insatiable desires of a people decidedly the greatest epicureans ever known in the history of gastronomy to the present day end of section eleven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section twelve of pantophenon this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophilon by Alexis Soyer. Fruits When the Creator placed the first man in the Garden of Eden, he commanded him to nourish himself with the fruit it contained and from that epoch the most ancient which the sacred work records this kind of aliment is incessantly mentioned in the history of all nations and at every period of their history the great hebrew legislator seems to have considered fruit trees worthy of his especial care for he forbade the jews to cut them down even on their enemies lands and in order to teach his people how to preserve them in all their vigor he declares the fruits of the first three years impure and consecrates to the lord those of the fourth he even goes further he exempts from military service any one who has planted a vineyard and all fruit trees conferred the same privilege until the first vintage heathen nations also understood the importance of this branch of agriculture and invented protective divinities such as pomona vertuminus priapus whose sole care consisted in protecting orchards from the inclemency of the seasons and dispelling insects and robbers who would damage and plunder the crops each kind had moreover a benevolent patron who could not honestly refuse to be useful to it thus the olive tree grew under the auspices of minerva the muses cherished the palm tree the pine and its cone were consecrated to the great sibel bacchus complacently ripened the perfumed pulp of the fig and the rosy grape which placed him on a level with the gods among the greeks fruits appeared on the table at the second course and were eaten either cooked raw or in the form of preserves the romans sometimes breakfasted on a small quantity of dried fruits but the third course of their senna or principal repast offered an incredible profusion of the productions of their own orchards and of those of three parts of the world rich patricians after they had exhausted all their immense resources of an incredible luxury 
in their garments, habitations, and banquets, contrived to plant fruit trees on the summit of high towers and on the house tops, thus suspending forests over their heads, as well as vast reservoirs to keep alive the most exquisite fish. At Rome they had an expensive but, as they thought, effective process of preparing pears, apples, plums, figs, cherries, etc., etc., and which was as follows. The fruit was chosen with great care and put, with the stalks attached, into honey, leaving to each one sufficient space to prevent their touching each other. Our housewives of the nineteenth century may, perhaps, be curious to try this Roman experiment, if the quantity of honey which it requires does not frighten them. End of section 12. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.